Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for another installment of Back to the Video Store. Today in the video store, we have with us Jason Lively. Now Jason is no stranger to the Back to the Video Store podcast, as he was actually the first guest at our live show last year at the Palace Theater, where we did a screening of National Lampoon's European Vacation, where he gave us a deep dive into what it was like playing the iconic character, the lovable Rusty Griswold. So today on the show, we wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about the cult classic, his 1986 Night of the Creeps. And along with that, we also get a little insight into how his character was written out of the film Red Dawn, what it was like working with Christopher Walken on Brainstorm. And also, he lets us know about how quite possibly, if it wasn't for the show, The Dukes of Hazard, the entire Lively family might have never gotten into acting. So thanks so much to Jason for popping into the store. And without further ado, Jason Lively. Jason Lively, so great to talk to you again, and thank you so much for uh, calling into the video store today. Uh, what have you been up to since we last saw you back in November? Well, Brett, I've been busy working on my house. <laughs> Home repairs. <laughs> yep, and uh, actually, uh, on top of home repairs and skiing a ton, I'm prepping up to go to, uh, I'm doing a little film that shoots in Monaco for 15 days with my buddy Jimmy Duvall. Uh, it's for an Italian production company, so I don't know if we'll ever see the light of day here in the States, but pay me to go to Monaco for 15 days, and I'm on board. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's awesome, man. That's fantastic. Hey, Jimmy Duvall, hey. That's right. That's awesome, man. Thanks, buddy. Um, so for those of you know, for those of you who couldn't attend the live show um, at the Palace Theater back in November... Uh, we did a screening you of really European. Missed out. Oh, you uh, really missed out because it was a lot of fun. I would say so, and we 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 focused on uh, National Lampoon's European Vacation. Um, but while you were here in Albany, is there anything that you uh, that stood out for you? Anything you would recommend to people who aren't from here to check out when they uh, when they come to Albany, New York? Yeah, let me tell you, I was shocked by how cool that little city is. I had such a great time. The people there were just amazing and so welcoming. Uh, what was the name of that donut place that I loved so much? Cider Belly Donuts. Cider Bellies. So, see, I even got it. Uh, Cider Belly Donuts. I'd say go there for sure. Uh, also, a very great little Mexican spot. What's the name of that place? Uh, you went to uh, El, El Locos. Yes, my friend. Another fantastic spot. Yeah, they're and awesome. And I'd say there. just cruise around that city and take in all the awesome architecture that's there. It was really a, really a blast. I enjoyed it a lot and look forward to coming back sometime. Oh, awesome. Yeah, we definitely want to have you back here. And, uh, you know, we, I, I was hoping to do Night of the Creeps, but, you know, we uh, the theater would rather have us do European Vacation, which was just as good. So I would love to have you back sometime to do Night of the Creeps, but uh, hopefully we uh, we can put that together. But... One of the things, uh, awesome. for, for those who couldn't uh, be at the live show, um, could you tell us anything that you recall from the your local video store, the one that you would usually go to uh, back in the day? Late fees. That's <laughs> really what stands out the most in my mind, was yeah. all the late fees I would incur. Do you remember the name of it or anything like that? Oh, man. You know... Because I'm not kidding about my late fees, I have multiple ones. <laughs> <laughs> Hopped around. <laughs> you know, I, it, it really is true. And I think you you touched on that a bit about how it's such a different experience now for kids. And the generation now doesn't even appreciate it, what it was like to look forward to the new movie coming out and going to the video store and running into your same group of people that would always be there or or reaching for the, the, the movie and just finding that the front cover's there, but there are none behind it, and that huge disappointment that oh, you yeah. would get. Absolutely, um, and the hunt continues. Yes, but it was really, I mean, it was a, it was a kind of a way of life that, that is gone because now you can get anything, you know, on demand and so many different forms of media to watch it. 
that that experience is something that's that's just gone. And I, I you know, I loved, uh, I still am a huge movie fan. Um, so I love being able to go to the to the video store and and take you know whatever the max was and load up and call buddies and hang out and just do a a weekend movie marathon and sometimes watch the same movie three or four times while I had it because that's kind of what what you did. Were you more? Uh, did you did you have like more mom and pop type shops or was it like a blockbuster Hollywood yeah, video no, type thing? Yeah, no, it was it was a uh, it was both. You know, I went through the time where I was living where it was like the mom and pop video store and then Blockbuster came to town and and kind of uh, killed all the little mom and pop stores. Unfortunately, but yeah. But then, you know, look, Redbox came around and killed Blockbuster, so that's kind of the way it goes. <laughs> the one left hanging strong in Alaska. <laughs> was Really? Yeah, there's one left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of a novelty now, but there's one one le- one Blockbuster video. Man. Put so, that on the go-to list. One of the one of the benefits of going to the mom and pop shops was always um, putting your name on reserve for getting some of the uh, the cardboard standees or the movie posters. Did Jason Lively have any movie posters hanging up in his room that you can recall from back in the day that uh, that stood out for you? No, I, I I never I was never cool enough to get on board with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was always impressed when I went over to someone's house that it had, and the movie poster was one thing, but when they had the, the cardboard cutout display, you know, that would be in the front when people would score those, that I always was a little jealous of. And I would always say to myself, oh man, I need to try and get one of those, but just never made it happen. And now they, I just saw I, I, the one for the movie's uh, Critters goes for about five to $800 now. So Come if you on. have one, <laughs> they are gold. So, nice. so uh, before we jump into the Night of the Creeps, a couple highlights um, from your career is uh, talk about jumping into things. You were in the pilot episode of the Dukes of Hazard when you were about ten years old. That's right, how, my friend. How awesome was that? Can you can you tell us anything you remember from that experience? Oh, I totally remember it, but I didn't. You know, no one knows when you're doing a pilot episode what what it's going to be. You know, it was just a. It was a cool gig. I thought the car was really neat and the people were neat, but I had no idea that it would turn out to be such a huge hit and run for so many years. And, and I was lucky enough to, to do the pilot, and my stepdad also was in the pilot. And I saw it recently because it was on Netflix, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'd forgotten that my little sister Robin was in there too. Um, but I think four years later... We ended up moving. It was because of that show that my family moved to L.A. Um, because my stepdad, Ernie Brown, Ernie Lively Brown, he went by Lively through Screen Actors Guild, um, he got a regular on the show for a full season. Um, he replaced Ben Jones, who was Cooter. He played L.B. Davenport, Cooter's cousin. And uh, <laughs> No way. It was for a full season yeah uh and so we ended up moving from powder springs georgia to to la and so, that's really what what made that happen so because of hazard because of hazard county that's what launched the uh the lively acting legacy pretty much you know it's what got us from small town stuff to at least into the mainstream where we could get bigger work that's amazing um, but yeah and i have a I have a big affinity for the show. So I was on it again once we went up there. I think it was about 14 uh, and did another episode called The Boar's Nest Bears, uh, where I played Rod Moffat, I believe was the name. Oh, Basketball my. star. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then, and then not too long after Dukes of Hazzard, um, you were also in Brainstorm, where you were... On the set with Christopher Walken, who has quite the reputation. Any specifics you, you took away from that experience, being so young and around someone like Christopher Walken? Very shaken, you know what I mean? Creepy guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, what they it say. Was awesome. Someone, someone said, uh, I, you know, it's really interesting because just last year, I don't know if you've read it, but if you were to Google National Geographic Natalie Wood, uh, not 
National Ge- Geographic. I don't know why I said that. Popular Mechanics. Um, Popular Mechanics magazine called me. And it was right around the time when I was getting ready to go out there to do the, the show with you in Albany. And it was a New York phone number. And I just assumed it was you or one of your people calling. And I answered the phone. And a lady on the other end says, hi, my name is so-and-so. And I'm a reporter from Popular Mechanics magazine. And I was like, what? <laughs> That's interesting. And uh, she said, yeah, we'd like to interview you about Brainstorm. And I guess the editor-in-chief had recently seen it and was just a huge fan and was kind of blown away by the film and the concept and and the amazing cast that was in it and how most people have never even heard of it. Um, But I ended up reading the article and I was just blown away. There's so many things in that that I didn't even know that they had done, the research that they had done uh, on how film stimulates you at different frame speeds. And, And the reason they wanted to do it, I asked why, you know, I was like, what? Popular Mechanics is doing uh, movie reviews on 35-year-old films. And, <laughs> and she said, no, it's it's because we, you know, Popular Mechanics is a, a science-based magazine. They like to know about how things work. And basically the film was VR, you know, decades before VR was a reality. Um, so it was a really, it's, it's actually a really interesting article. So you should maybe read it if, if you're curious about that kind of stuff but then also asked what it was like to work with christopher walken and we had the one scene that was a a traumatic scene where i I have the gear on and i'm having a kind of a bad episode and in it he's going crazy and he's strapping me into this whole whole you know contraption and you know he was a very intense guy and i i really liked it you know i didn't appreciate at the time um the caliber of of cast that, that I was around all the time, mm-hmm. and even even you know having the benefit of work with a genius like Doug Trumbull, but as I got older and realized like whoa Louise Fletcher that's pretty cool you know and some of the people and actually Natalie Wood I mean that's that's a huge feather in any actor's cap to say you shared screen time with someone like that so I, I have nothing but but gratefulness for being able to be a part of that film. Yeah, and it was it, ahead of its time is is an understatement, you know, as far as uh, when it came out. So for those who have not seen Brainstorm, make sure you check out Brainstorm. And uh, one of the things, one of the, the 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 questions that I got from a few different people after the live show is they wanted a little bit more information about when you you mentioned that at a young age you emancipated yourself um, sure. legally, and so. What, what what sparked that? And uh, yeah, give us anything else because you kind of gave me a, a, some backstage stories about that that were that was kind of interesting to hear. No, you know, here's the thing with Hollywood, and and you know, it's it's a tough business to get work, no matter how old you are. But especially as a kid, a, a teenager, when it's just as easy to hire the I people I call it the Ralph Macchio syndrome you know you got these people in their mid 20s that look like they're 15 and 16 so a lot of times they will hire older to play younger and that's because of the child labor laws and what happened for me was I had gotten cast in a role in the movie Red Dawn and I was so excited about that I read the script and just couldn't wait to do it because I, I just love that kind of stuff. That whole John Milius vibe with a, with a, you know, army stuff and do, shooting stuff. And do you happen to rem- do you happen to remember like which like was it a part in the, the group of the the teens there? It was, and it wasn't. It was. It was actually written out, so it's not someone that got the role over me. They just took my character oh. away from the film. Oh, that hurts. And, uh, uh, yeah, right. And this came down literally just a few weeks before it was time to leave to go on set. And the reason that happened was because at that time was when that horrific accident on the set of the Twilight Zone happened. Right. Yes. And and so that's when uh, the insurance company was like, absolutely no minors on this set. Um, and the only other... Um, person that i believe was still a minor 
at that time was Tommy Howell. Uh, and he was one of the, I think he was like number one or two. And I was around number three to become emancipated. And he wasn't emancipated minors. All that means is that you're legally an adult. Mm. You can, you know, bind into your own agreement, sign your own contracts and you can work like an adult. So the child labor laws don't apply to you. Uh, and I think Glenn Scarpelli maybe was the first kid to get it done. I'm not sure. And then Tommy, and then I did it. I'm sure there have been many since then. But but at that time, it was pretty rare. But I also feel that that was a big, a big benefit in me being able to get the role in European Vacation because it was just shortly after that that I booked that role as Rusty. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it was were they already in the process of become just so that they could work longer hours and stuff like that? And then once the uh, the, the tragedy on the Twilight Zone set happened, was there was like a sweeping uh, kind of across the whole industry of you know get those miners off the set. And if Red Dawn's gonna have army tanks and AK forty sevens, you know, right? That was it. They, that was the thing they said. There's just too 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 much explosives going on to where it's too big of a risk. Gotcha. Well, soon after, we then got you in the lead role of Chris in 1986, Night of the Creeps, which easily is in my top ten films of all times. It was one of those ones that was rented off in... Um, you know, worn out many times, so I was thrilled when it was finally released on DVD after all these years. And Thank ju- you. And just recently, we see some photos of you hanging out with director uh, Fred Fred Decker, and you guys were hitting up some of the local spots, uh, some of the sets from the films. Can you tell us anything about uh, that meeting, and can we maybe, maybe hope for a sequel in the future? Was there any talks with uh, Mr. Decker about that? You know, people always, you know, I think he kicks it around all the time, uh, but you just don't know with Fred. But I know that he has definitely been hit up uh, by fans at every event he does, asking uh, if they will do another Night of the Creeps. Uh, And, man, I'm so grateful for for the fans that that film has, because I would have never become part of the convention scene without that. And I love them, you know, that's how I know you. Of course, Um, yeah, yeah. And... uh, it would it would be nice to think so, uh, and and you just don't. I mean, I just can't say. But we did. Uh, there's going to be something coming out. Um, I don't know what it's going to be called, but it's part of Sean Clark's um, horrors hallowed grounds, where he goes to set locations from horror films, and I guess he's doing a feature and pick night of the creeps is one of them and so that's what i was doing out there and it was the first time i'd been back to to some of those locations since we shot the film and what what a blast i mean what a great trip down memory lane that was and to be there with fred this many years later was just and what it was just a great experience and, and that actually segues perfectly to the next question here was is it was filmed on that college campus with uh you know, a lot of uh, younger folks, and uh, was it was it the party scene that we could imagine? Since it was, you know, right in the right in the peak of the eighties, and uh, you're filming uh, you're filming a movie, you're in the lead role, so. And you know me. I'm I know you. Full advantage of that, my friend. <laughs> of course. <I'm> <laughs> it was a blast. Uh, I I may have mentioned to you. I don't know, but Steve Marshall and I. Uh, we actually rushed a couple of the frat houses that were there because uh, it was on. It was really cool. USC is one of the, the few universities that has fraternity sorority row combined, uh, and that's cool. And I'm sure they still do. But at that time, they just threw epic parties. I mean, they would block the whole street street and put up, you know, DJ booths at each end, and every single house would have a party. And if we weren't working. They'd have to try and come find us, uh, <laughs> you know, on the row somewhere. Were there um, were there any any scenes in particular that you do remember where you're like that was particularly rough to get to because of a, a partying later uh, earlier that night? Um, no, because we would usually work, and then if we got done early, go go hit it up, uh, and then we would be able to sleep the next day because 
95 percent of that film was night shoot so we'd sleep all day and come back and work at night Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, most looking through the interviews and through the the Blu-ray, uh, the making of featurettes, everyone described the set that Fred created there as just a very fun, laid back, comfortable environment. And it, the, the friendships between you and Steve and Jill obviously were very genuine. And after all these years, I, you know, I even met Steve and you at that same convention with uh, Mr. Atkins. Um was there anything in particular that you remember him doing that kind of fostered that environment that made it anything different from a, any other film that you worked on? You know, I think the fact that he was, he was a young guy, uh, it just made him really cool. He was always very approachable. He always would let you, uh, you know, interject or ask questions, but he was, he was very good at his job. He really was. He's, he's a great director and he knows what he wants. And, that kind of makes it easy, you know, and if he didn't like it, he would stop and you would do it again and he would give good direction and then we'd move on. So I think the fact that we, that he didn't seem that much older than us and that we really trusted him really just made it a a, a great working environment. And one of the little Easter eggs in night of the creeps is, is uh, the, the graffiti on the bathroom stall that says monster squad rules. This was pre Monster Squad. Did he? Was there any talk of him doing that movie? Did he mention like, "Oh, hey, I have this, this script I'm cooking up"? Because you know, again, as far as my top ten goes, Monster Squad is right on there. Was Was there anything you remember him mentioning? You know, I don't. I don't remember that. I remember, you know, I know I see that, and then the other one I remember seeing in there is Striper Rules, and that was written by the. Uh, the makeup artist who was dating the lead singer of that band at the time. I do remember that. I just love I that stuff. Yeah. Thought. I absolutely love, love those that. little things I put in there that, you know, are connected to something, you know? Yeah. Now on the set, you got to obviously work with the legend, Tom Atkins, um, the man, the man himself who actually has an action figure coming out. Um, you can, you can purchase now. And, uh, Anything you remember that, from working with Tom on set that that sticks with you after all these years? Um, well, one thing I can say now is he must be a vampire because he doesn't seem to have aged one day. A hundred percent. A hundred percent agree with that. I look at all the rest of us. I look at me, at Steve, at Jill, and I'm like, Tom looks exactly the same. <laughs> he really does. What is going on there with that dude? And that's why, uh, I mean, that's why I'm just saying, next time you talk to Decker, I know one of the things he mentioned is that he's hesitant to move forward with a sequel without having Tom Atkins involved and with his with his character meeting his, the demise he did. It'd be very difficult to have him in the sequel, but, you know, just throwing out there, I don't see why... You know they, yeah, they would have to do, like, uh, a la Lost, right? When they killed him off early, but they kept bringing them back into things that you didn't see in the first one you know before they had died scenes that had happened but weren't shown there, there's but so many things to do it that way that he would be able because no one wants a night of the creeps without tom atkins right <laughs> i don't want a night of the creeps without tom atkins i'm also just throwing out the idea of having his ghost kind of haunting you through some visions you know slash right. hallucinations kind of like an american werewolf in london so you could have him in heavy makeup, you know, kind of explain some of the age difference at that point, And he can be, you know, throwing out the sparky lines and everything could pick up right where it left off. I'm just throwing that out there next time you guys chat, you know. So <laughs> with uh, one of the other things that with with uh, with Night of the Creeps is that. Another movie that was definitely ahead of its time and that when it came out wasn't as well received in the box office as it deserved and then obviously gained its cult classic status later on. It, and, and there's lots of different theories about why it just didn't hit like it should have. Um, and I know some point to the studio not giving it the proper rollout to it deserves. Do you have any studio theories fault. about that? <laughs> I'm going to jump on that bandwagon. And, yeah. you know... Actually, what I think is that, you know, I've said it before. I think today's audience is much more savvy and and they get it uh, where at that time people were a little confused as to what they were seeing. Was it a, a horror movie or was it a comedy or was it a sci fi? You know, because it's a 
it's really a blend of it all. And uh, I think it just took a little bit of time for the marketplace to appreciate it for, for what it is. I, I also agree that the po- the first poster that they rolled out with the hand coming through the wall was very, or coming through the window of the uh, the door was a little bit confusing, looking very similar to the poster for House 2. And right. people, you know, and once they started kind of putting that together, I, I did kind of then jump on the bandwagon of, you know what, maybe if the studio kind of pushed this thing differently, it would have, uh, it would have hit. studio! <laughs> especially with all the posters, I think there's four or five posters altogether. Any one that sticks out as your favorite? Yeah, I mean, obviously I love the one where uh, I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. No, I, I like I like that one, the, the one where we're in front of the, the house and I've got the shotgun and Jill's got a flamethrower and and we're coming out. I think that one is uh, is my favorite. Well, I, we're definitely looking forward to the sequel and I know you'll be the first to tell me once you can if it's ever going to happen because it can be done. We definitely want to see that sequel. So again, when you see Fred again, make sure you uh, you keep chirping in his ear that, that we want that. You know, I'll shoot him a text as soon as we hang out there. And <laughs> Please get do. On, get on the riding bandwagon. <laughs> and, and our last question, um, when we had you at the Palace Theater back in November at the Back to the Video Store live show, we always want to ask every guest what their staff pick would be if they were working at the video store. And your choice for there was the Road Warrior, so Mad Max 2. So since this will be your second appearance, you are the only person to get two choices for the staff picks. Anything you would add that you can think of that you would put the the Jason Lively recommendation thumbs up on? Jaws. Jaws. Yeah. Probably one of the best films ever made. It caused me psychological damage, so you know it's a good one. Okay, you got it. Jaws and The Road Warrior are getting the staff pick. Jason Lively, thumbs up recommendation. Thank you, sir. (laughs) Well, thank you, Jason. We really appreciate you calling in the video store today. And uh, we look forward to you to perhaps having you on again to uh, do a live showing of Night of the Creeps. Man, I can't wait. Love you guys. Love what you stand for. And thanks for having me be a part of it. Dude, thanks so much, Jason. Appreciate it. You got it, buddy. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. So thanks once again to Jason Lively for calling into the store. And be sure to check us out on Facebook at Back to the Video Store and also on Instagram where you can stay up to date with what guests we have coming up next. We have all sorts of giveaways and contests. And we will be announcing our next live show at the Palace Theater very soon. And you'll be the first to know if you are following our page there. So do it. Thank you so much. And remember, be kind and rewind. Rewind.